Hello, today I want to talk about learning curves. And usually I just talk about the horses learning curves, but I'm going to talk about the horses and the humans today because I think it's really relevant. So, you know, what is a learning curve? Well, it would be nice to think that horses come out not knowing the lesson at all and then just gradually improve like this, get better and better and better. And off we go, we've learned the lesson and all is good. But it doesn't work like that, as we know in reality. Horses sort of learn a bit and they get really good and then they get bad again and then they get good and bad and good and bad. It goes like this, up and down, depending on the complexity and the difficulty of the lesson and how well we're explaining it. Uh, and eventually the horse learns the lesson, all going well. And we, if we are explaining the lesson well for the horse. So... Mm -hmm. You know, we need to be really aware of that. And I do stress that the more complicated or difficult the lesson is, the more learning curves the horse is likely to go through. And most of us will have experienced this with a horse. So we've, um, we've put the horse up, you know, we've brought the horse out, we've taught this lesson, and then we put the horse away for the day. And we've thought, oh, I'm so clever. You know, that's such a clever horse. It's learned that lesson. And then we bring it up the next day. And it seems the horse hasn't learned the lesson at all. You know, the horse might have absolutely no idea what we're doing. And in that case, you know, not a stupid horse. It just was probably going through a learning curve. And quite often at the beginning, the horse might get lucky. The horse might do a few responses that really the horse hasn't tested all the different possibilities. So the horse has just got a bit lucky and we've released on that. And we've thought the horse has, you know, really got that bit of information, but perhaps that isn't the case yet. So we've thought, oh, that's great. You know, the horse understands the pattern. The horse now has the habit established to so put the horse away, come out the next day to realize the horse hasn't established that pattern at all. This this can happen, um, what we can happen with any lesson, but it's a really obvious thing. Um, let's take an example. Let's take an example of teaching your horse to move its hips to the fence for mounting. Now with that lesson, we set the horse up quite well by putting it on the fence. So it's got a fence on its right side because the direction we want the horse to go is to move its left hip to the left, so towards us. So it's on the fence, so it can't move right then we're holding quite close to the bridle. So that makes it very difficult for the horse to move backwards or forwards. And we're standing sort of in front of the horse too. So that makes forwards quite difficult. Holding the bridle makes it quite difficult for the horse to move backwards. So that really leaves the horse with three of the six directions left to move. So it leaves the horse with up and down. So the horse might kick at you. Some of them do if you get the emotional level a bit wrong. Some of them kick at you. Down, the horse might sit down. We're hoping it won't, but it's an option. And the final one is to move the hips to the left, which is, of course, the one we're looking for, and that's the correct answer. So by limiting the choices, we make it much easier for the horse, but we also make it um, a little bit more difficult for ourselves because the horse can get lucky. So if we just cue movement, which is what we do basically with this lesson, then the horse, you know, is limited in choices. So it's not sort of experimenting with a lot of different options. It's only got really two or three to, to experiment with. And so when you're teaching that lesson, you'll find quite quickly that the horse starts to respond well. And quite quickly, the horse is going to step left and you start thinking, oh, I'm a bit of a genius here. You know, my horse is learning this in two seconds flat. Um, but what happens is if you give the horse a choice then, so let's say you cue the horse to move its hips to the fence, <clears throat> excuse me, and the horse moves two steps away from the fence. If you then cue for more movement to the left, the horse then has more choices because it can very easily move right. And so if you do that with the horse still away from the fence, if you ask it too early on, the horse might well move right and make that mistake. And that's just going to show you that the horse doesn't yet connect that cue with moving its hips to the left. But what it does is it changes the pattern for the horse. And what it becomes quite quickly then is, oh, move your hips to the left, then move them to the right. That's not what we want at all. So it's very important with that lesson that we make sure we've made that mental connection with the, <clears throat> the cue, which is to raise the whip,
the horse on the hindquarter with the whip to actually moving your hips to the left and not to get caught up in that learning curve. So the lower, you know, the less we can give the horse the opportunity to make those mistakes, the quicker the horse learns. So the quicker the horse learns is the less stress then the horse is subjected to during the lesson. So the better it is. And of course, the faster it is as well for the horse to learn the lesson. So in this case, because I know that the horse is going to pick it up quite quickly, the horse is going to quite quickly move its hips to the left because I've limited its choices so that the horse doesn't go way down in that learning curve and I have to retrain. I'm going to do something which changes the pattern for the horse to make it easier so I don't have such a learning curve effect. And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go around the back of the horse and lead the horse away from the fence with the right rein. Now, when I do that, I'm going to just watch the horse's hindquarters. And what happens when I do that is the hindquarters, as I'm leading the horse away on the right rein, the hindquarters go closer to the fence. And so that is really good for me because I want the hindquarters close to the fence on the left side. And so that changes the pattern. If I didn't go around the back, if I just straighten the horse up again, the hindquarters are likely to go back to the fence in the direction they just came. So we don't really want that. We don't want the horse thinking you move your hindquarters away from the fence, then you move your hindquarters back to the fence, then away from the fence and then back to the fence. We don't want that at all. We want the horse thinking you move your hindquarters away from the fence and then you walk away on the right rein. And so that sets up a bigger, longer pattern for us, which is gonna make it much easier for the horse. And that means the horse doesn't have to go through all those learning curves. So if you teach half of this lesson and then you put the horse away and then the next day you, you come out and you cue the horse that moves its hindquarters away from the fence and then back to the fence, you know, it's possible that you just put the horse away too early before the horse had actually understood that that cue connected the hindquarters to stay in self-carriage, so to keep moving left until you stopped cueing it. So that is a really good indication that you're, um, you haven't quite gone through all those learning curves that you, that you need to. So recognizing that the horse is in learning curves is very helpful for us because, you know, when we expect a horse to know something that we've taught, it might not be that the horse is just not very clever. It might just be that the horse is going through a learning curve. Um, and I think that we, we had a recent one this week, actually, just this morning in a meeting, I was discussing with somebody about them getting, teaching their horse to load on the trailer. So sometimes it's our, it's us, or quite often it's us going through learning curves and, and learning new things and adding new things to the lesson that actually really help the horse over time. But sometimes it takes us a while. And we, by doing that, we increase the learning curves the horse has to go through. Our example this morning was a good one. We had a, um, somebody in Canada. Now in Canada, they have, as in the US, they have more step up trailers than ramps. So here in Australia, we have a lot of ramps as we do in the UK as well. In America, there's more step up trailers. So most of my trailer loading videos actually talk about having the horse on the ramp and one foot on, one foot off, two feet on, two feet off. What we've found with the step ups is really you have to teach two feet on, two feet off, four feet on, four feet off because your horse is unlikely and you probably don't really want to encourage terribly much except for the front feet, maybe one foot. Um, the horse putting just one back foot on really once the horse is committed to getting on the trailer, you want the whole horse on the trailer. So there was that issue. The other issue was um, the, the owner wasn't keeping the horse's head in the center of the trailer. So that was another learning curve for the owner because it was really important that you do that. You keep the nose in the center of the trailer because as soon as the nose leaves the center of the trailer and the horse maybe walks around does a circle around or even just moves its head out and to the side that changes the horse's uh, visual field so that also changes it also breaks your bubble if you can keep the nose in the center of the trailer just pointed towards the center of the trailer even if you're three meters away where you start your lesson that is 50 percent of your job done pretty much 50% of your job done keeping the nose in the middle of the trailer. So even if the horse backs away from the trailer, just 
try to keep the nose in the middle because what that does is it limits the horse's choices of where it can go and also what it can think about by, by limiting its um, the movement of its nose. So in that case, the owner needed to hold a bit closer to the bit like we did in the gift in the um, hips to the fence lesson. So that was really important. The final thing there with that lesson was having the trailer open. So this was a two horse gooseneck slant load trailer. And this particular horse that needed the lesson used, was used to traveling right at the end. So that last stall, which hasn't got a lot of space and there's not a lot of space to get up into that either and so because that was where the horse was going to travel that was where the owner wanted to train it but I encouraged her to actually open the trailer up and train it with the trailer open because we've got to think about what it is we want the horse to do so what we want the horse to do is when it sees the open trailer when it's nose is pointed towards the open trailer and it's cued to step forward we just want it walking all the way in Okay. And that we want that to become an automatic response. So we have to train it in the easiest way possible for the horse. And the easiest way possible is to make it as big as we can. Because it doesn't really matter if you're loading it onto a really narrow little bridge or one horse trailer or something like that, or you're loading it into a great big six horse truck it doesn't really make any difference what we want the horse to do is have this automatic behavior if i see the trailer i see the bottom of the ramp or i see the open trailer step up and i step straight in and as long as that is an automatic response then it doesn't matter which position the horse is going to go into so that was an important thing because it by opening it up it made it much more inviting for the horse so those three things really limited that owner's or the horse's um, learning curves. So the horse couldn't then make quite as many mistakes. So it did make it much, much easier for the horse as well as for the owner. I think um, the thing to remember with horses is that they, they develop as a shopping list of possible responses. What we're doing all the time when we're training is we're moving something. So they, they can move each thing in six directions. They can move it left, right, back, forward, up, down. So the, what we need to do is explain to the horse which spot we're moving. That might be the nose, it might be the pole, it might be a foot, it might be the tail. It could be any spot on the horse we want to move. So it's our job to explain which spot it's our job to explain which direction we want it to go. And it's our job to show the horse what we're doing to motivate the horse to move that. And then, of course, to reward the horse, to so show the horse when it's moved that spot in the correct direction by releasing and rewarding. Okay, so all of these things. Now, the better we explain that, the fewer learning curves the horse is going to have, the fewer times it's going to spend down here being confused. Okay, so if we set out with a very clear lesson plan, then we're much more likely to limit those curves for the horse. We're much more likely to make it an easier, less stressful lesson for the horse. Um, does it take longer? No, of course not. It takes about half the time. You know, the more you can do here, the quicker it is when you get out there to teach the horse. The more we can train this bit between the ears and the less we try and train the feet and push the feet around, the quicker it is, the less stressful it is for the horse. And, you know, the more the horse wants to come back tomorrow and learn some more. So I think that is very important. But what we must remember is that once the horse gets this idea, you know, you've taught hips to the fence, you've taught your horse to trade a load, you know, you've taught all these things, the horse starts to get the idea, ah, okay. So I feel some pressure. It might just be the pressure of looking at you or it might be the pressure of raising the whip or it might be the pressure of your voice clucking to the horse to get movement. All of these things are pressure. Now the horse then learns, I feel pressure. I'm going to look for an answer in movement. And he's going to know when that answer is correct because you're going to release the pressure. You're going to stop clucking. You're going to stop looking at him. You're going to stop. You're going to put the whip down, whatever it is. Um, and so the horse develops it 
a shopping list of things, possible things, and it, and it tries them. So, you know, expect the horse to try anything that you release on. So it's good and bad, isn't it? You know, I have taught a couple of horses to rear. Now, I did that completely on purpose and I did it knowing that they were going to add those things to their shopping list. So, you know, before you teach something, know that it is possible. I have seen quite a lot of people teaching their horse to lie down. And that's quite easy to do by if you pick up, you know, one of the front feet and hold that up and then get the horse to move its weight backwards. And this is a sequence of things to do, but pretty quickly the horse says, oh, okay, I'll just drop to my knees and go down. Can be inconvenient when the farrier arrives and gives the horse, you know, a cue to hold its foot up, the horse might then think, oh, time to go down. I have seen that happen a bit. So, it, you know, it's a matter of making your cues very clear um, to prevent the horse from actually throwing in sort of everything it knows. Let's take an example. There's a lovely example of the round pen. Now, in the round pen, which I don't use for all horses, but when I do feel it would be a good idea, and quite often it's a good place to teach the horse how to learn. It's a good place to teach the horse how negative reinforcement works or pressure release works simply by um, putting the horse in the round pen and getting it to move. Now you can clack and you can look at the horse and if necessary, you could raise your hand. Or if necessary, you could throw the lariat behind the horse. As soon as the horse moves forward, you stop doing that. So if you have a horse that perhaps hasn't been touched, I've started a lot of brumbies, for example, if a horse has never been touched before, then they're quite nervous. And so just looking at the horse will usually get it to move. And that is pressure. You know, so for one horse that's never been touched, looking at it is enough pressure to get forward movement. So that would be where you would release when the horse moved forward. And for a horse that's been run around the round pen or chased around the round pen, you know, you might need a, a lot more pressure. But you can, of course make that less and less and less over time once the horse starts to respond to your initial cues. So let's take this horse, we've put it in the round pen, we've taught it to go forward and we've taught outside turns. Now I teach outside turns first because they're the easiest to teach. And I also like to know that I can move a horse away from me in case that horse has been chased in the round pen before or you know, might get aggressive for some reason and that when, if I don't know the horse's history, I just need to know, first of all, that I can turn it away from me. So outside turns are useful, good things to teach first. Once you've taught outside turns, your horse, it's easy. I mean, it's a very easy thing to learn unless you've got a horse with a really checkered history. Um, so one in a hundred horses will be a bit difficult to teach to outside turn. And that's mostly because of a history and they've had some experience in the round pen before. But otherwise, outside turning is easy. So then when you come to change that to teach the horse to inside turn, the horse will almost always respond with an outside turn first and, and for, for quite a while. So the inside turns, once you've established those outside turns, the horse gets that you're, you're in the middle, you're cueing the horse to move around the outside, then your body position changes, you cut the movement off and the horse turns to the outside. Now your inside turn, you have a very different cue, like your body language is very different. But when the horse first sees you move, it's going to make the mistake of turning outside. And, and this is one of those learning curves. You know, this is the first one. It's a really obvious one when you move from outside to inside turns. And it's very interesting to see because what you can really see with this particular learning curve is just how engaged the horse is with you. Because if the horse really starts to watch you, they can see that your body language is completely different. Yeah. And it's very important because it's very easy to tire a horse in a round pen. It's very easy to chase a horse in a round pen. And, you know, these are things that we really don't ever want to do. You know, if the horse is tired, it's not learning. If you chase the horse, you're um, increasing its, you know, likelihood of, you um, reacting with a fear response in future. So we don't want to do those things. What the round pen is great for is actually engaging the horse's brain and getting the horse accustomed to looking for answers in movement. So once it's made the mistake, if we can keep the horse under some pressure, either by clucking to it or just as fast as we can, getting the horse to move back in the direction we asked it to go, 
So if the horse half outside turns, the quicker you can correct that to get the horse going back in the direction you wanted it to go, the easier it's going to be to teach this new turn. And then you can really exaggerate your change in body language. And it is quite different if you think about it. If you think about um, an outside turn, you really walk into the horse. Whereas an inside turn, you back off and you look at the horse and you're inviting them to come to you. So that is a really good way of minimizing those learning curves for the horse. But I like the round pen for that reason, because as opposed to if we're teaching the horse something in hand, the round pen the horse does have more choices. It really does. And so it can really help us actually to start building that bubble with the horse from a distance. Some horses we have to use the round pen because they haven't been handled or, you know, they have some other, something else in their history that um, prevents us from working safely very close to the horse. So the round pen is a much safer place to be in those cases. And we can, you don't need to do any work fast in the round pen. All of it can be done at walk, but it, we can stay safer if we need to be at a distance from the horse. Um, and so it's a great place to teach your horse about pressure release uh, before you have to get closer to it. But it is definitely a much harder place to um, learn these lessons because the closer you are to the horse, the smaller your bubble needs to be. As soon as you start getting further away from the horse, you have to have a larger bubble, which means it has to be stronger. So I try and leave round pen work until a little bit later on, if I, if I possibly can. Obviously, can't do that with a horse that's never been touched because I haven't caught it yet. But um, I do think that it's something that is easier to learn for the horse if the horses already have been through a series of learning curves where it's learned other lessons where it's got really good and then it's got maybe a little bit confused and then it's got oh i get this yes 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 i understand and so it's made some mistakes the thing about the learning curve is the horse gets to make mistakes you know if we go back to the trailer example again i had a horse the other day that i was teaching to trailer load and the first sort of five minutes or three minutes, he was quite, um, well, pushy, I'd have to say, a great big horse, quite pushy on the ramp, was trying to push me off the ramp and um, all of this sort of thing. I, I had a bridle on him and so that, that didn't work at all. So his next strategy was to go all the way onto the trailer <laughs> and I couldn't stop him. He just he really sort of went straight through me onto the trailer. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want you on the trailer. You know, I never asked you to get on the trailer. And so, you know, we have to sort of think about that. We have to really think now what, what is my lesson? Because my lesson wasn't to get the horse on the trailer. My lesson was to get the horse in the bubble. And my lesson then was to teach the horse to move forwards and backwards in that bubble. My lesson was to get the horse into self-carriage, moving forwards and backwards, and into self-carriage, moving forwards onto the trailer and resting and moving backwards off the trailer. Because this horse's problem actually wasn't getting on the trailer, didn't want to get on the trailer because it knew it had to get off. So this horse's problem was getting off the trailer. Now, I need to teach getting off the trailer very slowly because it's a ramp, it's difficult, they can't see where they're going. It's the most difficult thing. And quite often, horses really don't have a problem with getting on the trailer. They rush off backwards because they're scared of the backing up part. And that's why it's important to teach getting on and getting off at the same time. And if you don't go through those learning curves, which you go through as you get one foot on, two feet on, two feet off, three feet on, three feet off, there's learning curves in there. If you don't go through all of those, you skip the training. So by the horse going all the way onto the trailer, it might look like, and so the owner said, oh, great, you've done it. I'm like, no, no, I haven't. I've completely not done it. You know, this is so not done it. Um, what it looks like is you, you've got your end result but you haven't because you haven't done the training because you've missed the whole middle bit. You've missed all of those learning curves where the horse is actually cementing that um, new information and the horse is actually developing those habits. So if the horse is rushing off backwards off the trailer, it is doing that because it wants to get it over and done with. So it knows the pattern. It knows when it goes on at some stage, it's going to have to get off. 
So it hurries through that to get it done quickly um, because that's the scary bit. And so what we need to do, we're not actually teaching the horse to get on the trailer, we're teaching it to get off. So by going all the way on itself, it skipped those lessons of how to back off slowly and carefully. So those are the learning curves that are really, really important. And that's the sort of thing, you know, if the horse goes on, you think, oh, that's great. It's done it, it's learned the lesson, put it away, bring it out the next day, try to put it on the trailer and it goes, yeah, no way, I'm not going on that, it's scary. <laughs> and we think, oh, stupid horse. But of course, we just actually haven't, it. the horse just got lucky. So we've talked a little bit quite recently as well about um, horses suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And quite often these horses will come out and you might think, oh, it's a learning curve. You know, yesterday it seemed really good and today it doesn't seem to know that at all. And I think this is very different. And there hasn't been any research yet on post-traumatic stress disorder in horses. In fact, we don't even, as yet, as I make this, I, we don't even know that it exists. It hasn't been shown to exist. I can't think that it doesn't exist. It would seem crazy to me. Um, I'm sure it does. And they've shown it in dogs. So it's just a matter of time, I'm quite sure. So it's something that really interests me. But I do find one of the things that with horses that are probably suffering from this is that they tend to um, learn a behavior and then they might come out the next day and it's like they've never done it before. And they tend to be going along quite well with a lesson, for example, and you think, oh, this is great. This horse knows it. And then suddenly it's like they wake up and they don't know where they are. It, it's a very interesting thing. And um, as I say, we need a lot more research on it, but don't mistake that for a learning curve because I don't think that is a learning curve at all. I think that's something quite unique to these particular horses. And I, you know, I, it's one in a hundred or something, I would think that they're suffering from this. Um, and when we have some more research done on that, I will, I will let you know. It's, but um, yeah, quite a different thing. So when your horse is learning a new lesson, you know, expected to get good, and then get bad and then get good and then get bad and then get good and then get bad and get good. And it does go along like this. So do expect that. Always try to end on a good point. You know, I, I do think that helps enormously. And, um, but do expect even when you come out the next day, especially if it's a complicated lesson where you're putting different things together. So take flying changes, for example. Now, flying changes, you've got to control the shoulder as well as the hind quarter. And so that's a much more complicated lesson than just controlling the shoulder, for example, to do trailer loading. So it's, your horse is going to go through more learning curves with that. All right. That is it for me for today. If you have some questions, hang around because I will turn the recording off and have a chat to you in a minute. Thank you. Bye.